Um, I don't know where your mind wanders to when you have just kind of like some free time just to think. Um, or like, uh, you know, if you just sit in your chair and you're just thinking about things. Um, or sometimes, this has happened the last two nights to me and I don't enjoy it, but when you wake up at 3 a.m. and your mind just won't shut off, uh, what kind of things do you think of? Um, this will reveal how like kind of nerdy I am, but sometimes I think about why certain nations rise and then just completely face dive and fall. Right? Anybody else are like, hmm, the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire. Well, yeah, see, I, I think about just silly things. But have you ever thought about that? Like, why do certain unstoppable nations that just seem like this nation is going to exist forever, this will never end, this golden era, and then inevitably they just kind of do a, a complete face dive and then they, they, don't, they no longer exist. If you think about the Assyrian Empire or the Babylonian Empire or Greece or Rome or all of these kind of golden empires, they all ha have inevitably just died out. And so what causes that? What causes these nations to inevitably implode? Are there common factors? Now, I know kind of the Christian biblical answer, which is not wrong, would be, well, it's the Lord God who decides when nations rise and fall, and I agree, but are there things that go on in these nations that, uh, uh, that contribute to their downfall? Are there common factors if you looked throughout history, oh, in all of these nations that rose and then had this golden era and then fell, can we look at common things? Um, this is a thought that actually lots of scholars think about. Um, you know, even Sigmund Freud, if you know him, he was a psychologist and a, uh, you know, a researcher and things like that. Um, and he, he actually talked about this and his answer was, well, civilizations are neurotic and crazy and they just destroy themselves and probably it's because they restrict sex. So if you just allowed nations to go run wild with all of their desires, then they wouldn't implode. And many scholars looked at Freud and said, you're insane. That makes no sense. And, and so even there was a man by the name of Dr. Carl Zimmerman. He was a Harvard sociologist and a professor at Harvard. And in 1947, he wrote a book entitled Family and Civilization. And his whole career was studying this exact thing. Why do civilizations and empires decline? And is it somehow related to sociological reasons? And so what he did is he wrote this book and did research specifically about the Greek and Roman empires. He noticed eight patterns in both of those empires that were leading up to a fall, eight different patterns. And then he says, there's actually 11 symptoms in all of these nations that are symptoms of final decay. If you can look at a nation and you see these 11 symptoms, you know the implosion is not far off. So here they are. Here are the 11 symptoms Dr. Zimmerman wrote about. Number one, no-fault divorce, increased disrespect for parenthood and parents, meaningless marriage ceremonies, defamation of past national heroes, acceptance of alternative marriage forms, widespread attitude of feminism, narcissism, and hedonism, uh, a propagation of anti-family sentiment, acceptance of most forms of adultery, rebellious children, increased juvenile delinquency, and then lastly, a common acceptance of all forms of sexual perversion. So as I read that, you might be thinking, I think Canada's 11 for 11. Eesh, how much longer do we have? But it's fascinating that these are the 11 symptoms. Notice that it's not like, oh, well, when a nation's military is weakened or when the economy is weak. Notice that none of that's there. And actually, do you notice how many are directly related to the role of family, parents, and children? Seven of them directly related. All of them are kind of somewhat related, but seven of them are directly related to the downfall of civilization. When your kids rebel, when marriage isn't held in high uh, uh, esteem, when uh, parenthood is looked down on, when juvenile delinquency, when adultery is happening, all of those contribute to the fall of a civilization. I find that fascinating. The family relationship between parents and children is absolutely 
absolutely crucial that even empires rest on that relationship. I would say that scripture actually, long before the empires of Assyria or Babylon or Greece or Rome, scripture said essentially the same thing in the Ten Commandments. The fifth commandment that God gives to his people has everything to do with the relationship between parents and children. Uh, So the Ten Commandments are kind of split into two sections. We've just completed the first section. The first four commandments are directly related to your relationship with God. Some scholars call these kind of like vertical commands, right? They all have to do specifically with how you, you and God interact. So, you know, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make any idols. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. Honor the Sabbath because God himself is the one that, that put forward that pattern. And so all of those first four commandments directly relate to our relationship with God. And then the last six commandments are what scholars sometimes call uh, horizontal commandments, So they deal specifically with your relationship with the community around you, right? Murder, adultery, lying, stealing, honoring your mom and dad. Those are all kind of uh, horizontal commandments. And so now we're entering into this second part of the 10. And the fifth commandment specifically is about honoring our parents. And it's actually meant for the flourishing of human society, which history actually confirms So what I want to do this morning is just kind of go through and ask a few questions. What does this command actually mean? Why is it here? Why is this one of the commandments? And then really a big chunk of time at the end is how do you and I seek to obey this commandment? So kids, it's actually uh, pretty special that you're in the service this morning because I'm actually going to be addressing you guys So kids, if you're listening, in a a little bit, I'm going to talk directly to you because this commandment actually deals primarily with you as kids. So make sure you listen, and I'll I'll tell you when. Um, So let's read Exodus 20, and verse 12 is where the fifth commandment is found. It says this, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. So right away, I just want to clear something up because some of you might go, okay, I don't have any kids and maybe both of your parents have already passed away. And so you're like, should I just get my phone out and play a game on my phone? (laughs) Does this not relate to me? Uh, But I would encourage you to still listen because the concept and the principle of honoring and respecting and submitting applies to all people. But sometimes we're just called to honor and respect and submit to different people depending on your stage of life or just where you're at. And so if you read the Bible, the concept of you as an individual respecting and honoring someone applies to all of us. We're all called to honor and submit to different types of people. So even, for instance, Ephesians 5, it says, wives, respect your husbands, right? Honor them, submit to them. And some of you are like, well, I'm not a wife. Okay, well, that one maybe doesn't apply to you yet, but if you're a wife, it applies to you. Um, some uh, know the in Ephesians 6, the employer-employee relationship, right? We don't have slaves and masters anymore, but the concept, the principle is the same. If you have a boss, you should honor them and respect them. And a boss, you should be a good boss to your employees. Um, Hebrews 13, 7 says, if you attend a church, you should submit and obey your church leaders, the elders that God has placed over you. Submit to them. So that applies to all of us. Um, Even 1 Peter 5.5, it says, young men, respect your elders. So if you're a young man, you're called to submit to older men who are your elders. Romans 13, all of us are called to submit to the government. And then really, I mean, the biggest blanket statement for honor, respect, submission is all of us multiple times are told we all submit to the Lord Jesus. So the concept of honor and respect and obedience and submission, it applies to all of us just in different ways. So just because you're like, well, I don't have kids and my parents are no longer uh, with us, I, I, I would still say there's principles that you can draw from this that affect the different relationships that you do have. So what does this command actually mean then? Honor your father and your mother. Um, The Hebrew word for honor used here is kabod, 
which is a verb form of a Hebrew noun, and the noun is glory. Um, it's the verb form for the noun glory, and the Hebrew word kabod, which we translate honor, it actually means that something is heavy or weighty. This is interesting, right? Heavy or weighty, your father and your mother. <laughs> You're like, what? <laughs> but actually, when you think about it, it is the perfect word to use here. What the, the Hebrew word kabod means that there is a, a weight and a heaviness to the role of mom and dad. And to honor them would be, I'm going to treat someone with the, the proper respect that their role is given. There's a, there's a weightiness to a mom and a dad's role in the lives of their children. And moms and dads, if you are moms and dads, you know there is a heaviness to it. There's a weightiness to the responsibility. So what this command is saying is treat your mom and dad with a measure of weightiness to the relationship. Um, if we were to look for the opposite of this command, it would be Deuteronomy 27, 16. It says, cursed be anyone who dishonors his father or his mother. And the word dishonor translated is to lightly esteem, which makes sense, right? If I'm going to honor them, there's this heaviness to the role. And if I'm going to dishonor them, I just treat their role as lightly. Like, who cares? I'm not going to listen to them. You just treat the role as just kind of this light, frivolous thing. Um, this command is, uh, is quite a serious command. It's repeated a bunch of times in scripture, but um, there's one example in Deuteronomy 21, verse 18, that says this, if a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him, will not listen to them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of them and bring him out to the elders of his city at the gate of the place where he lives, and they shall say to the elders of his of his city, this our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Um, like if I grew up in ancient Israel, rebellious son, yeesh. Like it's, it's, there's like there's heaviness to this command, is there not? Like, the Lord seems to take it quite seriously. Um, e even multiple times, the punishment in Israel for cursing parents was capital punishment. It was death. In Exodus 21, in Leviticus 20, in Proverbs 20, in Proverbs 30, the punishment. So if a kid cursed their parents, capital punishment. So thank goodness we don't live under the old Mosaic law anymore. But the command to honor looks different depending on the stage of life that you're in. And I'll get to this in a moment in the application. But so, for instance, the way that a toddler honors their parents is different than their adult children. The way that a teenager honors their parents looks different than when they're a toddler. It's just, it depends on the stage of life that you're in. And we're going to get that to that in a moment, but the question then is like, well, why is this command here, right? God has given us 10 words, right, 10 commands. Why is one of them about the parent-child relationship? Why is this command here? And you need to know this is not a threat, right? I know that I just told you, <laughs> like, capital punishment, but this command is actually not a threat. It doesn't say, honor your mom and dad or else. What does it say? Honor your father and mother and then there's actually a promise that comes with this commandment. Honor your mom and dad so that your days will be long in the land. Honor your mom and dad so that it actually goes well with you. If you read Deuteronomy 5, which is the Ten Commandments written again, it actually adds your days will be long in the land and it will go well with you. Right? So it's like God is saying, hey, children, do you want a long, blessed Life where things go well with you, honor your mom and dad. The reason this command is here is because the parent-child relationship is the first and probably the most important relationship you have. It's first, meaning when, when you're a baby, their, their relation, your relationship with your parents is the first one you have. And it's the most 
important relationship that you will have. You learn about authority over you in a parent-child relationship. You learn that there's actually authority that exists beyond just yourself. And in the parent it's my parents. They're the ones that have authority. You actually learn about the authority of God over you in a parent-child relationship. You learn to listen to people. You learn to honor other people in a parent-child relationship. You learn to do things you don't want to do. Right? Kids? You learn that, okay, I don't want to do this, but I'm going to because I'm going to obey my parents. Clean your room. Shovel the driveway. Take out the garbage. Do the dishes. Right? You're learning to do things that you don't necessarily want to do. And listen, I tell my kids all the time when they're like, you always just make us do things. And I said, think about it. I'm preparing you for your future job. When your boss is like, I'd like you to do this, and are you going to throw a temper tantrum? Hopefully not. I don't want to do it. Well, then you're fired, right? I tell my oldest girl that all the time. If I was your boss, I would fire you. <laughs> what? Okay, I'm going to clean my room. Right, so you, the parent-child relationship, you learn to, they, there's things that you have to do that you don't necessarily want to do. You learn, hopefully, you learn respect, you learn obedience, you learn love, you learn mercy, you learn compassion, you learn protection. Now, we're going to get to it in a moment because I know what I'm painting right now is the ideal picture of a mother and a father who do all these things. And I know many of you maybe didn't have that. And we'll get to how you obey this command, even if you didn't have ideal parents. But the reason it's here is because a parent-child relationship is probably the most important one that you will have. Um, it's so important that even Paul essentially just repeats the commandment in Ephesians chapter 6. Speaking to children, he says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And then here, he quotes the commandment, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. So even in the New Testament, Paul in Ephesians and Colossians, we see it elsewhere in the New Testament, that principle is still applied. Listen, children, it is a good thing to obey your parents. It's a good thing to honor them. The family is the basic social and spiritual unit that God has designed. A family offers care and protection. Children need parental advice. I know that there is some, in, and we'll get to this in a moment, but it's the idea of like, well, just let your kids do whatever they want and they'll figure it out. They won't. They need parental advice and guidance. That's how God has designed it to work. And the family is just kind of this base social and spiritual unit, so much so that if the family goes, what have we looked at at the beginning? The nation goes. So kids, little kids, they need their parents. And then actually, as you get older, it reverses. And aged parents, aging parents, they should be able to rely on their adult children, to provide for them, to care for them, to show them gratitude, to repay in some small way all that they've done for their kids. So it's an important command, and you can see why it's here. All of these commands, I want to remind you, all of these commands are not God saying, I'm going to ruin your life now by making it really hard. All of these commands, God is going, I'm giving you these so that your lives will be blessed and flourish and thrive. So then the question is, how do you and I obey this? What does it look like just practically to honor our fathers and our mothers? And so I'm going to give you three ways that I think you can obey this commandment. And again, each time it, it looks differently depending on your stage of life. But three ways you can obey this commandment. Number one is respect. How do you honor your mom and dad? Well, you should feel the weightiness of the position that they hold. Like parents, you, you, hopefully you feel the weightiness of it. Um, every time I've held my uh, newborn baby, we've got three kids, every time you, the doctor first puts the newborn baby in your hand, it's like you can feel the weight of like, I'm responsible for this human being. It's, there's a weightiness to it. You have a, a role in shaping their values. You have a role in teaching them. Parents, you have a role in showing your kids the gospel. I mean, it, it's on you. Like even Deuteronomy 6, if you, the Shema, 
uh, Israel, they would, they would recite this, Behold, uh, uh, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Uh, and then it says, parents, teach that to your children. How are my kids going to know the love of Jesus? It's you, parents. You're the one. It says, teach them as you walk along the road and as you lie down and as you sit down. Teach them at the dinner table. Write it on the, the door. It's like take every opportunity you have to teach them what? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You are the ones that will show them the gospel lived out. And so kids, you respect your parents by feeling the weightiness of their role. By prizing your parents highly, by caring and showing affection for them, by ultimately respecting them. There's a few passages that talk about this. Proverbs 13, 1, a wise son hears his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. How do I respect my, my mom and dad? Well, I listen to the things that they tell me, right? I value their opinions. A, a scoffer is someone who would say, my parents don't know anything. So teenagers, if you're listening, don't be a scoffer. Don't say, oh, my mom and dad don't know what they're talking about. No, scripture would say, actually listen to their instructions. I often say this to my kids when they don't listen. Um, I often say, believe it or not, I've been alive a lot longer than you have. And I actually know things. And often I'm like, listen, I'm not trying to ruin your life. You just need to trust me that I know what I'm talking about and still, you know, I want to say that they're always like, yes, Father, I will trust you. No, a lot of times they eye roll. But listen, don't be a scoffer who just says, I'm not going to respect my parents' wisdom and instruction. Leviticus 19.3 says, every one of you should revere his mother and his father. The word revere is the word like fear, a healthy fear and respect because of the position that they hold. Proverbs 23, 22 says a similar thing. Listen to your father who gave you life. Don't despise your mother when she's old. Respect them. So kids, if you're listening, how would this look just practically? This would be talking to your parents with respect. This would be listening to the advice that they give you. Um, adults, if you're listening, this would be how do I, how do I respect my parents? Well, it's, it's honoring them as they age. It's actually still going to them for instruction and advice. Now, the, the relationship changes because when you become an adult, uh, you are now starting your own family, right? Even Genesis 2 says it's good that a man leaves his mother and his father and goes and finds a wife and he clings to her, right? So listen, even the relationship with my parents, my parents don't tell me what to do anymore, they're not like, Andrew, we think that you should do this and you must obey us because we're your parents. It doesn't work like that anymore. The relationship has changed, but I still go to my parents out of a, uh, respect and honor and I want to know the advice that they have to give to me. So I do this often with my dad. I've shared before, like my dad has been a pastor for almost 50 years and so I often go to him. Dad, what would you do in this situation? Now, I don't always put into practice the advice he gives me Right, but oftentimes I'm like, hey, out of just respect and honor for a man that has raised me, and I go to my mom as well for advice for a woman that's raised me, and they've poured into me, and I look at their example, and I go, okay, I need advice from them. That's showing respect to your parents as they age. I mean, even when, I've shared this before, but even when we candidated 10 years ago here, before we came, I asked my mom and dad lots of questions because they've candidated a lot of times. What should I expect? What kind of questions will they ask? What should this happen? How should I do this? What should I answer? And then even when it was kind of like we were deciding whether to come here or not, I asked my dad, okay, dad, what percent should we expect from the church to say yes? And he was like, well, just expect that 80% of people will like you. And I was like, okay, and I actually didn't take that advice. I said, you know what, 95%. And my dad said, son, 95% of people are not going to like you. Uh, and I was like, ouch. But, uh, right, I still went to him for advice. Dad, you've done this before. Give me advice. Mom, give some advice to my wife. You're a pastor's wife. What should she expect? I think that's a way that you respect your parents as, as you get older. I think... One of the ways you honor your father and mother is by respecting the position that they have in your life. The second way that we honor our parents is by obedience. So kids, I'm going to primarily be talking to you for a couple minutes. I think primarily if you're a child who lives at home, 
uh, you're not an adult yet, you haven't moved out, then the primary way that you can obey this fifth commandment is that you will obey your parents. That's how you will honor them, by you will cheerfully obey the things that they ask you to do. Um, lots of passages talk about this. Proverbs 6, 20 and 21. My son, keep your father's commandment and forsake not your mother's teaching. Bind them on your heart always. Tie them around your neck. Even Colossians 3.20, it says, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. So listen, kids, I know sometimes when your parents ask you to do things, you question, why are my parents doing this? They're just being mean. They're making me do things that I don't want to do, whether it's clean your room or put the dishes away or vacuum the rock or whatever it is. But actually, kids, one of the ways that you not only just obey your parents, but one of the ways that you obey Jesus is by saying, you know what, I'm gonna obey my mom and dad. I'm gonna actually honor them by listening to the things they tell me to do, and I'm gonna obey them. Do you know who obeyed their parents in scripture? Jesus. There's a story in Luke chapter two where Jesus goes to the temple and then his parents can't find him, Mary and Joseph, and they're kind of freaking out and they finally find him and uh, he kind of says, well, I had to be in my uh, father's home, right? Because God is his father. But do you know what it says after that? It says that then Jesus went with them and he was submissive to his mom and dad. So kids, even the Lord Jesus obeyed his parents. Um, actually, one of the, scripture tells us one of the signs of things getting really bad in the world is when kids disobey their parents. In two passages, in Romans 1, Paul is describing kind of like the breakdown of society, and he starts with all of these terrible things, and then they start worshiping other uh, things from nature, and then they exchange normal relationships for wicked, twisted ones, and then it goes on and on. And then he ends Romans 1 with just a list of terrible things. You know, they become murderers and liars, and they steal, and they do all these things. And then right near the end of the list, you know what it says? And they disobey their parents. That's a sign that it's not going good in the nation. Actually, in first, uh, or rather, 2 Timothy 3, a sign of the end times, like, oh man, Jesus is going to be coming back soon because it's getting bad. In 2 Timothy 3, similar list, murderers and liars and adulterers. And then it says, and if you believe it or not, kids will disobey their parents. That's a sign that it's getting really bad. So kids, I think one of the, the easiest ways that you can honor your mom and dad is when they ask you to do things, you obey them. Now, I get it that all of us are going to mess up in this, and you'll, you won't obey perfectly. So thank goodness that Jesus forgives us, right, and we can ask for forgiveness and be, be made clean and forgiven, and then we can pick ourselves up and keep trying to follow Jesus. Um, parents, you can actually help your kids in this. Right? The commandment says that kids are to honor their father and mother. But parents, you can actually help your kids uh, obey this command by being someone who expects honor and obedience. Um, parents often fall into one of two ditches when it comes to parenting their kids. The first ditch that parents often fall into is that you rule your house with a very heavy, authoritative hand. You rule with an iron fist, and my kids never get out of line, and I will punish them. Actually, Scripture warns that you don't do that. Ephesians 6.4, it says, Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in, yes, the discipline and instruction of the Lord. In Colossians, when uh, uh, Paul says a similar thing, he says, don't provoke your kids to anger. In Colossians, he says, why? Because your kids will become really discouraged. So don't use excessive discipline. Don't abuse your children or discipline when you're just so angry with them. Because in your relationship with them, parents, you have an opportunity to show them the gospel, to show them mercy, compassion, grace, the character of God as you deal with them. So don't fall into the ditch where it's like, okay, I'm going to discipline my kids and boy, oh boy, I'm going to discipline them. Don't rule your house with a heavy hand. Don't crush their spirits. Now, I would say in our day and age, most parents fall into the second ditch, 
which is essentially the exact opposite, where it's like, you know what? I'm just not going to discipline my kids at all. Right? There's a, there's a whole new movement, this idea of um, gentle parenting, where if you've done some research, and I have read some articles and watched some videos about this whole kind of new thing where it's like, we're just gentle parents. The basic premise is we just don't want to set boundaries for our kids. I don't want to say no to my kids. I never want to raise my voice to my kids. I want my kids to like be friends with me. And I'm going to let kids decide what the boundaries and what the markers are. And I'm just here to like give them a friend's advice for what I think would help. Do you know what another name actually that's used for gentle parenting is? Not parenting. It's just not parenting. I'm just going to not do my role that God has given me to guide and direct my kids. I'm going to let them decide. You're just not being a parent. And actually, I talked with a man last night. This is not a new phenomenon. In the 1940s, there was a man by the name of Dr. Benjamin Spock, and he taught many of the similar things. Allow your kids to kind of set the boundaries and do what they want to do and just come alongside them and, and help them. You're just choosing not to be a parent. Kids actually thrive when you give them clear boundaries and consequences and demand obedience. Um, And beyond that, I mean, Scripture tells us to do this. Proverbs 13, 24, whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. What I don't mean, don't read that and go, sweet, I got to go find a rod. No. Do you know what the word is? It's a shepherd's staff. Is the example being used? And shepherds don't go, my sheep's out of line. I'm going to beat the snot out of it. No. A shepherd's staff is, oh, man, my sheep are headed towards a cliff. I got to get them away from there. Why? Because they're going to die. And I'm going to use it lovingly, and I'm going to direct my sheep. And what Proverbs is saying is, parents, you have a responsibility and a role to discipline your children so that they actually obey this command and flourish. Actually, Proverbs would say, Um, If you are a parent who's like, you know what, I don't believe in discipline, I'm not going to do it. What Proverbs would say is you hate your children. Not only that, I mean, just read Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12 is a great example of this. In Hebrews 12, um, verse 7, it says, it's for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. So when you're like, why is God disciplining me? It's because you're a son, you're a daughter. Every parent should discipline their kids. So God is no different. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you're left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you're illegitimate children and not sons. So do you see what the writer of Hebrews is saying? If you never experience discipline, you're not actually a true child. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Do you see that this is so similar to the fifth commandment? Honor your mom and dad. Why? So that it... It flourishes for you. And Hebrews 12, it says, discipline's not fun. It's painful. But what happens? It yields a fruit later on of righteousness. So I want to encourage you, parents, um, you need to step into this. And by doing that, you, you will actually be helping your kids obey the fifth commandment. If you say, you know what? There are consequences when you disobey. There will be discipline in our house. And listen, I get it because I'm a parent of three young kids and a lot of times things happen and I heard of some amens uh, last night from this, but sometimes you're like, ah, is this worth the fight? Ugh, I'm just so exhausted. Is it worth the fight to put my foot down and discipline? And I just have to tell you, yes, because you reap what you sow. And I know in the short term, it's like, you know what, it's easier if I just let my kids be free range kids and whatever, I'm not going to discipline them. You reap what you sow. Your relationship with your children will be terrible later. And I'm speaking from experience from people I know who said, you know what, we tried this whole, no consequences, no discipline, and their kids now are awful. So I get it, man. It is hard in the moment when I am exhausted and my kids disobey, and I'm like, okay, there has to be discipline. But parents, step into it. 
Because why? Because you will reap benefits later. Massive benefits. So step into it. I get it that parenting and discipline is hard. But this is what God has called us to do as parents. Because we love our children. Now, is there a limit to obedience? Um, Yes, always. With any of the relationships that we even talked about at the beginning, right? If anyone would ever say, I am uh, commanding you to disobey God, you don't need to obey them. Right? So hopefully this, this doesn't happen. But right, if a parent was telling their kids to be involved in something that is completely disobedient to what God has for them, that child is not obligated to obey. Because why? Well, because first and foremost, our obedience and allegiance is to Jesus. It's similar, you know, if a wife, if a husband is telling his wife, I want you to be involved in some scandalous thing, the wife should say, no, I'm not submitting to that because it's sinful, right? So always, 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 there's a limit to our uh, obedience. First and foremost, we obey Jesus. So parents, I want to encourage you, help your kids in this. Be someone that says, you know what, in our, in our house, we just expect honor and obedience. And kids, cheerfully obey your parents. That is the easiest way that you can keep this fifth commandment. And then lastly, how do we honor our mother and our father? Um, we show them gratitude. Um, how often, kids, do you actually thank your parents for the things that they do for you? Like, do you thank your parents for the care that they give you, the love that they give you, the support that they give you, the discipline that they give you? Do you thank them for the food that they put on the table and provide for you? Do you thank them for driving you to all of these different things that you're involved in? Do you thank them? Like, listen, kids, I just have to tell you, you have no idea the sacrifices your parents make. Sleepless nights, worry, prayer, anxiety over you. So I think gratitude goes a long way to show honor to them, to to thank them. Um, Adult children, I think the way that you show gratitude to your parents is that you care for them as they age. That as your parents get older, you begin to say, okay, how can I take care of you? How can I show gratitude to you for for all the the years that you've been my parent? Um, Jesus did this in John 19. Jesus, um, actually hanging on the cross in unimaginable pain, sees his mother and then one of his disciples, John. And in John 19, you can read that Jesus made sure that his mother was cared for before he died. Um, Even in 1 Timothy 5, 4, it says, but if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household. And here it is, and to make some return to their parents. For this is pleasing in the sight of God. Do you know, you want to know what God smiles on? What is pleasing to him? When adult children, you take care of your parents. God God delights in that. When you, I love it that it says in, in in like in some small way, try to make some return for all the things that they did for you. So show gratitude to your fathers and your mothers. Now, two things to end. I just want to give a word to those Um, who maybe did not have good parents. I I know I've been painting this ideal, right, of kids who respect their parents and obey them and show gratitude and parents who expect honor and obedience and they discipline their kids because they love them. I'm, I'm painting, like, the ideal of what it could look like. And I know many of you did not have that experience. That perhaps you had fathers and mothers um, who did not do a good job in this. But I want to just challenge you a little bit that even in spite of that, out of obedience to Jesus, you can still choose to honor them. You can say, you know what, regardless of the job that they did raising me, I'm actually going to still respect them. I'm not going to participate in in slandering them. I'm actually going to speak well of them. And I'm going to do as much as I can to be grateful for the things that they tried to do well. Perhaps... uh, as a way to honor them, you can say, you know what, I, I'm actually going to forgive them. If they're still alive, maybe you can say, you know what, I'm going to do my best to seek reconciliation with them. And I think above all, regardless of the, the, the experience we've had with our, our parents, God, our Father, is the standard. And so if you had a, a mom or a dad that just 
just didn't do a good job. I mean, we look at God in Scripture and His character and His attributes, and He's the standard. He's your Father. And then lastly, what, what about this promise? In Exodus 20, it says, verse 12, Honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land. I think what, what God ultimately is saying is if kids, if you learned how to honor your mom and dad, your life would actually flourish. I don't think that God is necessarily saying, like, I'm going to honor my mom and dad. I'm going to live to be 127. I don't think that's what it means. <laughs> because even in the Deuteronomy 5 passage about this, it says that it may go well with you. So ultimately, what's the principle? There's a blessing when you honor your parents that actually it leads to a, a flourishing of life. It leads to you thriving and having an abundant life. That, because this is the way that the world is supposed to work. And actually, the blessing also is a blessing of a lasting legacy, right? If parents, you uh, expect obedience, and kids, you obey your, and then you grow up, and then you have kids, and it's meant to be, man, your extended family is going to flourish if you can figure out how to honor your mom and dad. Um, even a few years ago, um, actually, it's probably four or five years ago now, we kind of had a mini family reunion down in Souk where my parents live, and all four of us kids, I have three sisters, all four of us kids um, with our spouses and our children were able to sit at this big long table and eat dinner together. And man, oh man, you could just see my parents just saying like, I am just, I'm just basking in this abundance, this flourishing that God has, has given us. So my prayer for you is that this command would not be a burdensome thing that God, oh, God's just trying to ruin my fun. He's a, he's a joy kill. He's a wet blanket. But that, kids, you would look at this commandment and go, man, isn't God amazing that he blesses us when we honor our moms and dads? That adults, that you would go, isn't God amazing that he's given us parents and I want to honor them as they age and take care of them and show gratitude? I think we would see um, families flourish. I, I, I've said it, I think, before, but with all of these commandments, um, when, we, when you live in a world that essentially is doing the opposite of all of them, man, oh man, you will stand out as a light in the darkness if you say, you know what, we're going we're gonna to live the way that God designed us to live. And people would look at your families and go, man, why, why are they flourishing? And then you can point to the grace and mercy of our God. And I know that, uh, I, I hope that you don't leave with feeling just, oh, I'm a failure. <laughs> because thank goodness that our salvation is not dependent on this. And that when I fail as a parent, that I can seek forgiveness and Jesus forgives me and cleanses me and he picks me up and he says, okay, keep going. So it's never too late to ask for forgiveness and repentance and, say, and to say, you know what, we're going to start doing this. So, Father, I just thank you for your word. God, I thank you that you, for our own flourishing, have told us to honor our moms and dads. God, I thank you that this commandment is not a threat, but that it's a promise that if we can figure out how to honor and respect and obey our parents, that actually there's abundant life that comes with that. So God, I just pray for the children in the room um, who primarily this really applies to them. God, for the children in the room that live at home with their parents, um, God, I pray that you would help them to obey. God, I pray that they would have an attitude of respect for their parents. God, I pray that they would cheerfully obey what their moms and dads asked them to do and that they would show gratitude for all the sacrifices their parents make. God, um, help us as parents in this. I pray that we wouldn't fall into these ditches of parenting, but that we would say, you know what? I love my kids so much. I'm gonna set boundaries and I'm gonna, I'm gonna help them to obey 
God, I just pray that you would do a work in each one of our hearts, maybe with those of us with aging parents, that we would figure out how can we show gratitude and honor and respect to them as they get older. And God, I just pray that you would do a healing work in people's hearts who did not have great parents, that they would be able, even in spite of that today, to say, you know what, I'm actually going to choose to honor them. I'm going to forgive them. I'm going to seek to be reconciled with them. All because we just love you, God, and we want to honor and obey you. So help us in this, Lord. And I just pray all of this in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen.